Because I know at this point you are surely dying to know. So what are our local keystone species right here in the San Francisco Bay Area? And what can you do to uh, help improve the ecological health of the place that we live? So Stephanie uh, has a beautiful native plant garden in San Leandro. Her garden was featured on last year's tour. Uh, after this event, you can go to the tour's YouTube channel and you can take a tour of Stephanie's garden. But today, Stephanie's talk is garden as if life depends on it. And now that you have heard Doug's talk, you know that indeed it does. So Stephanie, would you like to come on? Yes, here I am. Everybody hear me? Yes. And I'm going to share my presentation in a moment, but just want to say I can only second what Doug said about the, the feeling of empowerment just in your own backyard. Uh, I'm, for five years, years, I've had my own yard, and while I'm very jealous of the super cool caterpillars that Doug uh, saw, <laughs> I see mostly brown moth caterpillars, but um, it really works. So let me share my presentation. Um, let me go to the right view here. So I want to bring it to the Bay Area so we know um, what we can plant here to make a difference, what Doug calls the keystone plants, those that are um, just, just powerhouses for our, our local uh, insects and, and um, thereby birds. Um, can you guys hear me? Kathy, did you say something? That sounds like it's good. So uh, this is a chart that Kathy actually put together and just sort of a visual comparison of the number of um, moth and butterfly species that are natives, the green ones on the left here, support versus non-native ornamentals. And clearly there's a lot more uh, on the native side and this is for the Bay Area. So we used a Calscape and just kind of cast a large web like the nine counties and just looked at what are those plants that are like the, the most powerful for birds. So uh, picking out just the one on the left, the oak, uh, 270 species supported versus say an acacia with just eight. So why not go for the oak? And if you uh, were to ask what the birds would plant, they would probably like this list. So um, just to tell you how this came together, um, looking at the long list that you can get on uh, Bring Back the Natives uh, website, we put the ones that are um, have different criteria. They're easy to grow. Uh, they're, they're also available in local nurseries. We're lucky here in the Bay Area with a lot of native plant nurseries. These are commonly um, some they have. They also have uh, generally low water needs. Um, for example, willows are super good keystone plants, but a uh, few of us have a creek in the backyard, so they just need too much water. So we did not include those. And then of course they um, uh, support a lot of butterfly and moth species here. You see that on the right, these numbers. Um, so uh, we won't have time for all of these, but I just wanna give you a sense. It looks like kind of a short list, but these are all large families of plants that have a lot of um, um, kinds and, and types within them. Like for example, if you look at the Manzanita, there's um, 90 different species out in, in the wild, and I think 140 cultivars or so that you can get in the nurseries that have everything from ground cover to sort of shrub size, but also large ones like tree uh, type manzanitas, like this Dr. Herd that can get easily like 12 or even more feet tall. Um, so you have quite a range. And speaking of ground covers, this would be the native strawberry. Uh, that has uh, 58 species that it supports in moths and butterflies. And there's some that are good for the shade, some for the sun, sunny areas. You can even, um, they even tolerate light traffic, foot traffic. So great uh, replacement for lawn. Um, most of the plants over here on the list are uh, do want sun or, or part shade at least, but say some of our native currants and gooseberries, there's um, several that are good in the shade or part shade. And they bloom really early in the year. So it's great for uh, pollinators when not much else is around January through March and the hummingbirds. So currants are also on the list. Um, and pollinators, Doug talked about those uh, a bunch. Uh, it, you don't have to decide, am I gonna plant uh, for pollinators or am I gonna plant for um, moth and butterfly caterpillar so I have the birds. They usually do both, like our native asters, that's definitely one of our keystone plants here in the Bay Area. 
uh, supports a ton of pollinators, uh, the native bees, you see a um, non-native honeybee on here, but we have thousands of native bees uh, that are supported by these plants. Um, for example, the um, goldenrod you see here, blooms late in the fall uh, or late summer fall, uh, like the aster when not much else is out there. Uh, so great, great plant to have in the garden. And um, some of the native bees are specialists. They can't just go to any old uh, nectar and pollen plant. And um, some really uh, need the, the goldenrod. So another good one to plant. And it really does work. Uh, if you plant it, they will come. Uh, these are a couple of shots from my garden. Um, on the left here, the beautiful uh, Western Swallowtail that probably hatched somewhere in my yard, even though I didn't see the caterpillar. And I caught this little Townsend warbler outside my window uh, until I have a good camera. I won't have a lot of great bird photos, but here are a few. So it's really encouraging. I want to square away a couple sort of myths and uh, misperceptions people have about native plant gardening. And one would be that, oh, I have to totally convert my yard. All the ornamentals have to go, all has to be native. And it's really not, not uh, like that. And it doesn't have to be that religious. If you just put in one native plant or just start experimenting, like say, you have an agapanthus, um, it's not a native to California, it doesn't support any um, caterpillars actually, or you, you want to put that in or you have it in, why don't you go instead for say a silver bush lupin? So it's one of the many lupins we have here in the Bay Area, supports 75 types of um, caterpillars, has about the same height, um, beautiful blue, so just start swapping out stuff and um, adding some more natives to your yard. Another concern that I've heard is that uh, folks think, oh, well, when I put in all these um, caterpillar friendly plants, I'm gonna have all these, you know, insects um, showering away at my plants, it'll be ugly and, you know, probably kill the plant. But um, I mean, you should be so lucky uh, in my yard. This is just sort of a snapshot into my backyard just a few days ago. Um, I really don't see that. I think it's that um, if you have diversity, they keep each other in check and um, uh, they, you don't have vegetable crops necessarily. It's not a monoculture. So I just have not seen uh, visible damage from caterpillars. I'm actually super excited when I find one and you see back here um, and oops in in the back is a chaparral mallow and here's a close-up of it um, went out there yesterday and I was kind of excited to see these holes chowed into the um, side of the plant here one of the leaves and getting closer this this is maybe a tenth of an inch a tiny caterpillar that was uh, munching away so that's going to be a nice snack for a bird and uh, that's why natives are awesome in the yard and especially these keystone plants. Um, I'm hoping to go over a few in a little more detail. Um, uh, those I have in my own yard so I can speak a little more from experience. And in the end, I'll share a couple of resources. So oak, Doug talked a lot about the oaks and we have quite a few of um, 20 kinds here in California. Um, listed a few here on the slide and probably the best known one is the Coast Life Oak. It's probably also one that's um, the easiest to get in nurseries. But of course it's pretty big, you know, I can get 20 to 60 feet uh, and, you know, few of us have the room in our yards. But um, the bottom one here, the leather or scrub oak, that's actually a native, a really small type of oak. Um, it's only three to 10 feet or so. So that could be an option for your yard if you want uh, an oak. Let's look at some of the uh, caterpillars and butterflies that are fed by the oak. We, we know there's 270 and one iconic butterfly is the California sister. And I have to sort of disclaim, I, uh, very few of these are my own photos because as I said, I, I actually often don't see them maybe as butterflies, but I rarely see the caterpillars and that could have to do with the fact that they're really well camouflaged. You see that here on the left, uh, looks like a dried leaf or a little twig, but that's actually the California sister's caterpillar. 
Another one is uh, the beautiful golden hair streak, really little. It's only about an inch uh, wingspan. And uh, the, the caterpillar on the left is kind of pupating, so it doesn't even look like a caterpillar much anymore. Um, and as mentioned earlier, you know, among those uh, 270 species, a lot of them are moths. And uh, maybe they're not as spectacular. You see the, the oak moth here on the right, little brown guy and the caterpillar on the left. But, you know, those, look at that little uh, sausage, perfect for um, bird chicks. So a lot of uh, the, the species we're looking for are, are moths and they feed the birds just the same. I actually, this is one I did see, uh, not on a coast live oak, but this is, I believe, a valley oak. Um, I found this uh, caterpillar here on the left. And then on the right, you can see how it's uh, munching down on the leaf here. Um, thought that was really cool. Like Doug pointed out, they actually drop down into the leaf litter, moths primarily, to um, pupate and often over winter. Um, so please leave your leaf litter in place. Here's a shot of oak leaf litter. It uh, not only provides space for a habitat for caterpillars and other insects, but it also keeps your soil cool and keeps the moisture in. So um, better not to rake. And I want to share a quick story about my oak. I'm lucky that I have a large lot. This is on the left. Um, my side yard um, five years ago was all lawn and weeds. And I first thing sheet mulched, you see that on the right here, and then planted an oak, it's a uh, coast life oak in a 24 inch box, looked kind of gangly and uh, lonely there in the beginning. But now this is just a couple of days ago. This is my backyard from um, side yard really from two angles and it's a lot of sort of lower growing shrubs as well. And the oak is uh, 15 feet tall and uh, there's always bush tits in there. There's always a lot of birds. Uh, jays take the oak, uh, the acorns. Um, it's, it's, um, one of my favorite plants. So you probably don't have room for that or may not have room, but you want a tree. Let's look at the, the wild cherries and uh, plums. Again, put a few um, that are more easily available uh, on the list here. And in the picture, you see the Western choke cherry. That is a small deciduous tree. It's uh, up to 20 feet, so still tree size, but uh, smaller than an oak. Uh, I have the Catalina cherry and um, it looks like this. This is not mine, but uh, just to give you a sense of the picture, pretty neat small tree. And when you look up close, it has really nice glossy leaves. This is from my backyard and it's in bloom here and um, uh, grows about 12 feet tall. Uh, so it's not, not that huge. And you see on the left, uh, it's also a really great a pollinator plant. There's a big old bumblebee on there. Uh, now looking at some, some of the caterpillars uh, that uh, the Catalina cherry and, and the wild cherries host, there's uh, the Viceroy. And now I also know why I rarely see the caterpillars. On the left here, it's uh, supposed to look, it's trying to look like bird poop. So I, I read that and I think it kind of works but it is the caterpillar for this beautiful butterfly. It's actually kind of big three inch uh, wingspan. Another beauty is uh, the, the swallowtail and maybe the one I showed you guys earlier uh, did hatch right there on my cherry. Uh, that's the caterpillar on the left. And I, I just find it amazing how it's got these eyes on, on the rear end. And those are obviously not eyes they're just to scare off any birds. Uh, trying to eat it and hopefully birds still eat it anyways. They certainly like to eat uh, the um, Western yellow striped army worm. Another one of the 246 species of moths and butterflies that uh, white cherry support. And uh, here you see it up close, nice and soft, good, good baby chick feed. A super favorite plants of mine are the California lilacs, also a, a great keystone plant group that thrives here in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
Um, there's so many different types of, you're bound to find one that fits your need for your garden situation. So you see the Ray Hartman um, tree uh, ceanothus here in the picture. They come in all kinds of uh, sizes. This is one in my front yard. That's the Wheeler Canyon, about six feet tall, I'd say. And uh, they come in blue and uh, some are white. They uh, bloom in the spring, early summer, sort of different times of the year, some quite early. Um, and uh, even ground cover. So this is a beautiful uh, picture here. Uh, thanks to Pete from East Bay Wilds, and that's uh, the Hurst ceanothus. That's uh, just the ground cover, just a few inches tall. So you can take your pick. You see the leaves are from really tiny and, and uh, to larger, and blues from deep blue to kind of like light baby blue. Really gorgeous plants. And here are the butterflies they support, or rather the caterpillars that we want for birds, right? So uh, the California tortoise shell is uh, one. See the caterpillar here on the left, pretty inconspicuous little dark uh, guy. Here's a moth. So just important to always think of the moth, not just the butterflies. You may not see them. I, for example, never seen a silk moth. They're out at night, pollinating at night and uh, looking for nectar. Uh, but this one is four inches wingspan. I, I would love to see one at some point. Ceanosis is also a super important native uh, bee and pollinator plant. When I stand next to mine, it's just literally buzzing. There's so many bumblebees and um, honeybees, um, wasps, other pollinators on there. So kind of rushing through this, but I wanna show you the buckwheats. This is another large group of plants, lots of choice here. It almost seems a low with only 56 species of moths and butterflies that it supports, but that's still huge. I mean, I, I don't have a list like, like Doug, um, but I definitely uh, see a, a lot of activity on there. So there's 125 different species of buckwheats here in California. Um, they also have seeds that, that birds come for in the fall. Uh, also great pollinator plants. Most are sort of a creamy white. Uh, there's this beautiful red, uh, pink, uh, the rosy buckwheat that you see in the picture. And they come in very different sizes. So um, here is, that's just sort of up to two feet, the rosy buckwheat. Uh, but you can have up to eight feet. This is the uh, St. Catherine's lace, the giant buckwheat. Again, here on the left, I uh, just put a few names down. So you get a sense and um, when you look up close, when it's in bloom here, you can really see why it's called a lace, St. Catherine's lace. It has these huge umbels that are great landing paths for pollinators. And then even later, th these bloom sort of like early summer into the fall and look beautiful when they're just sort of rust colored and uh, attract bees. I always have a lot of goldfinches coming for the seeds. But um, the reason we're talking about these are the, the butterflies and moths. Before I get to those, I wanna show you my favorite uh, buckwheat. This is the coast um, buckwheat. Uh, gets about, I wanna say maybe one and a half feet tall. And I have it here uh, next to the sidewalk. It's a great ground cover. It really crowds out weeds nicely. It's super dense, hardly water it, just gets a little drip irrigation. And um, what's really exciting is I, I was trying to cut it back the other day from the sidewalk and I kind of lifted it up a little bit and um, I saw the um, under the uh, leaves here over to the right, I put yellow circles around them because they're so hard to see are these um, brownish pupae. So the moth caterpillars, once they chow down on the buckwheat, drop down into the safe uh, under story there. And then that's where they um, turn into uh, the winged insect. But you know, you see your birds um, scratching around in, in the ground and get those out. So definitely good bird food. Here are uh, a couple of beautiful butterflies. Um, the buckwheat supports these little hair streaks in the Ackman blue, for example. Here's the Mormon metal mark. And you can see on the left with the fingernail is a really small caterpillar beautiful little, little butterfly um, and, and many more. So I, I just gave you a tiny taste. 
uh, of, of the biodiversity you can see in your, your yard really comes alive. It's so much more than, than a pretty plan to look at. You start looking for the, the activity and the, the animals and insects after a while, and it's just um, much richer that way. I used Calscape a lot to not only find plants in my area, but also see, well, what exactly are the, the species um, those that plant supports? Like here's an example of the coast buckwheat, and you can uh, look at all the butterflies and moths that Calscape lists. Another super favorite tool of mine that I just want to quickly pitch to you guys is iNaturalist. So you see the picture on the left here. This is an app that you have on your phone. And I took a picture of one of those um, uh, uh, caterpillars I found in my buckwheat. And you upload it. And I took just screenshots here of what the screen looks like. There's a function where you say, well, what did you see? You just put out the question. And then uh, Calsca um, iNaturalist gives you a few options. So here it's thinking, well, probably a cutworm or dart moth. And then there's a bunch of um, possibilities. So you can narrow it down and, and learn about um, the insects you, you're hosting in your garden. So uh, I think we are just about done with the 20 minutes and I'm gonna uh, stop sharing, but not until I, um, quickly show you the, oh, it's not gonna, let me do this. I wanted to show you where these resources are on the, um, on the website. But uh, Kathy, I think you are also showing that. So it's okay that my PowerPoint is stalling on me. So let me stop my share. If I can find the right button. Yeah, all right. All right, well, Stephanie, thank you so much. That was just terrific. I know it was a lot of work to put that together. Thank you. Uh, so at this moment, I wanna show you some of the resources. Uh, well, let me say before I go on that, uh, if you go uh, to the agenda and uh, click on Stephanie's name, you can link over to her garden. You can see more photos of her garden and you can see her, um, her plant list and you could download it. Uh, but at this moment, I'm gonna show you how you can find even more resources to find out what are our own local keystone plants. So here we are on the Garden Tours website. And I'm gonna go down now to the bottom uh, where it says keynote speaker, Douglas, tell me resources. I'm clicking there and this page comes up. And what I'm looking for is this one called plant lists. And I'm gonna click on the Excel file so I can sort it. So this is the San Francisco Bay Area native plants, our own local native plants, and the number of species of butterflies and moths that will lay eggs on them. That was provided by Dr. Tallamy. Also by comparison, if you're talking to your mom and you wanna show her what's in her garden, you could go look at the list of non-native ornamental plants and the numbers of species and butterflies and moths that lay eggs on them. But let's look at this one, our local natives, the Excel sheet. So I've sorted this to show them from highest down lower to the number of species of butterflies and moths that can stay, that can lay uh, eggs on this plant. And you can see what Stephanie was talking about here. Um, and maybe you think like, wow, this is a lot of information. I'm not really that familiar with native plants. I can see these numbers, but I'm not really sure what I would have in my garden. You can go back to the Douglas Tallamy resources and look here at the list of readily available native plants of high value to butterfly and moss is for the San Francisco Bay Area. I put this together. So I went through Dr. Tallamy's lists and I pulled out plants like Stephanie did that are readily available, will grow well in your garden. You can find them in nurseries. They're of high value, uh, reproductive value to butterflies and moths. So that will make it easier for you to develop uh, your own local native plant lists. 